Good evening. I'm honored to bring you greetings on behalf of Elizabeth City State University's Community Connections Performance and Lecture Series. We would like to thank our sponsors, Truist, Microsoft, National Endowment for the Arts, Duke Energy Foundation, First Citizens Bank, Trustee Phyllis Bosomworth, and contributions from my very own ECSU students for making this event possible. The Community Connections Performance and Lecture Series mission is to produce cultural experiences which can be enjoyed by students, faculty, staff, as well as the community at large. We are especially excited to officially welcome home our ECSU alumni for this Vikings A Different World. While our main attraction is our esteemed guest of honor, it is equally important to ensure that our discussions are guided with expertise and grace. To do just that, we have the privilege of introducing our moderator for this event, Mrs. April Woodard. April Woodard is a Hampton Roads native and one of the original hosts of Coast Live when the program launched in 2016. In 2018 and 2020, she was nominated for a Capital Emmy Award for Outstanding TV Host and Moderator. April got her start as a reporter and anchor right here at WTKR-TV3 in the late 90s. April spent more than a decade as a New York-based senior correspondent for Inside Edition. There she landed one of the last interviews with Joan Rivers, reported on 9-11, and did red carpet interviews with Kanye West, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, and J-Lo. 
She also served as an anchor and reporter for Black Entertainment Television, hosting specials including A Conversation with President Obama, Michael Jackson, Forever the King, and Music Around the Globe, which was nominated for an NAACP award. April is a visiting journalism professor at Norfolk State University and a media and marketing consultant for Favor Multimedia. As a graduate of the University of Virginia, she lives in Chesapeake with her husband, Pastor Adrian Woodard, and two children, Adrian and Alec. Please, let's give us a warm Viking welcome to the stage, Mrs. April Woodard, who will introduce our guests and serve as moderator for the evening. What's up, Vikings? Come on now, what's up, Vikings? Welcome home. How's everybody doing? All right, all right. I'm so excited to be here to the Chancellor Dixon. Thank you so much, Truist Bank. Everyone who has me here, I am just so delighted because I remember every Thursday night at April Woodard's apartment, even though I went to a PWI, I have got mad history at HBCUs longer than four years, 22 years. I grew up on campus at Norfolk State University, so I know what the HBCU experience is like. But I'm telling you, I loved this show. I wanted to be on the show. I needed to be on the show, but they just couldn't make room for me, but I'm so delighted. I am so delighted to introduce our guest here tonight. Our first guest, well, he is known as Ron Johnson, but he, yeah, but he is an actor and producer and executive producer and a serial entrepreneur. Please welcome Daryl M. Bell. Wonderful. Thank you, <laughs> Our next guest is a Emmy nominee and NAACP Image Award winner, actor, dancer, dancer, beautiful Broadway, and she played none other than Whitley Gilbert. Please welcome Jasmine Guy. She played Jalisa Vincent. Yes. She is a singer, a Broadway actress, and founder of a New Day Foundation, Dawn Lewis. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, Emmy Award nominee. Image Award winner, award-winning voiceover artist. She played Freddie Brooks. Please welcome Cree Summer. <laughs> oh, I love the flavor. I love the flavor. <laughs> and last but not least, Actor, director, writer, and all that. Please welcome Kadeem Hardison. He played Dwayne Wade. Oh! What's up? Yeah. <laughs> Here they are, ladies and gentlemen. But we're not going to get to the question and answer just yet because we have got so many surprises for you and uh -oh. so many things in store. Before we begin, I do want to welcome the ECSU Sound of Class. They are the number one band in the C.
All right. Was that bad or what? Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, that was so live. You all, and I love the shirts. Black voters matter, yes. Yes. Let's get out there in November, y'all, and 2024. All right, so um, I think we have another little surprise. I'm gonna put on my glasses and make sure I can see. I'll make sure I get this right. So, um, I think Hillman's homecoming was 1998. Uh, let's think back to Hillman's homecoming, 1988, season two, episode seven. <laughs> Based on my research. <laughs> and uh, it was called The Stepping Stone, right? Yeah, anybody remember that in 1998? Who was around in 1998? Okay, I was, because every Thursday at April Woodard, or April Wilson at the time's apartment, it was, a different world was on. All right, Gilbert Hall was one of the dorms, y'all remember, on Hillman's campus, yes. And I have been told that ECSU has recreated the scene and has a special presentation. So at this moment, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to the recreation of the Gilbert Hall Steppers Viking style. Excited. Okay, where's the Divine Nine? Let's hear them. Yeah. Yeah. I knew y'all were here. I knew y'all were here. Special shout out to my women of Delta Sigma Theta Sorors. All right, we're ready to begin. We are ready to begin. Where shall we begin? All right, good night. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is what I've been waiting for. I loved about A Different World was 
first of all, the name encompassed everything, right? So it exposed people to the world that I knew growing up because I, I was on a HBCU campus, but then also the viewers that may not have come back from our experiences or come from our experiences were able to have a different view of what our lives were like at HBCU. So, you know, people who were out there that didn't know anything about HBCUs and all of them and, you know, our sororities and all of the lifestyle and everything. And it really just brought everybody together. And what I loved about each of the characters that they all had depth, they all had um, originality, everybody was different. You know, and you represented so many different people and you spoke for so many different people. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I loved about it too is that there was a message. And long before there were messages on TV like there are today, there were messages on a different world. And I appreciate for you all bringing that to the audiences. And for those of us who watched, who learn vicariously through your experiences on the show. So I first want to start off I'm gonna start with Dawn. Okay. Cause uh, we had lunch the other day and I got a chance to get a little, dig a little deeper into you know, being my investigative reporter. Did y'all know that Dawn Lewis wrote the theme song to a different world? Some of y'all didn't know that though. Play it. I was ready to start crying. <laughs> she was about to start crying when y'all played that song for her because that was her first connection to a different world. I want to know about your experience uh, on a different world and how you shared with me how you got in the door. Because first, you know, you you were a dancer, you were a, a artist, you're a performer, you're a singer, all of those things. And I know we all have many different talents on the stage, but I just want to know about how writing that song led to you being on the show. Well, actually, writing the song and being cast on the show happened at the exact same time. Uh, and the people who did the music didn't know me as an actress or a dancer. I was doing a tour of a Broadway show by the same people that cast the Cosby show and was begging for three months to let me audition, and they told me no. They finally turned around and said, would you be interested in coming in tomorrow? There's this one role we haven't cast. I said, sure. An hour later, the musical director had my cassette tape I was trying to be a recording artist and said, you wrote this music, you're singing this music, would you be interested in working with me on the theme song for a new TV series? And I thought it was a joke. So literally, they happened at the exact same time when he told me it was for the spinoff of The Cosby Show about Lisa Bonet going off to school, starting this new chapter, and what the premise of the show was. I basically wrote my story. It meant a lot to me because I was 16 when I started college. And so telling that story of the people in your life having that faith in you, propelling you forward despite the messages of failure, of this isn't for you, of nobody wants to see you or checking for you, me writing those words of empowerment was me regurgitating back to myself, talking to myself to go forward boldly. So to be cast in the show at the same time, then my whole life has changed. Uh, so it was an honor to write that song. It's an honor that you still embrace the words and embrace the message of the song and of the show. And uh, no, playing Jaleesa has just been really an honor for all those people who haven't given up on themselves. Come on back to school. Yes. Seek out that new career. It ain't over till it's over. So uh, God, that is blessing, 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 blessing. Thank you so much for that. And as I was saying earlier, this show really had a, a profound influence on the audiences that watched it. And it exposed people to the black community, to our culture, to HBCUs. So I'm just interested in hearing uh, what each of you all have to say just about the impact that your show still has on uh, the people who watch it, the people who consumed it originally, and who continue to watch it. You want to start out, Kadeem? Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening. Okay, so just to, just to refresh the audience's <laughs> memory, because the audience probably wasn't, you know, maybe the mic wasn't loud enough. Okay. So um, what is the impact that it has had on HBCUs <laughs> and exposing people to HBCUs, as well as um, heightened people's uh, awareness of yep. the impact and how significant HBCUs are. There you go. <laughs> I got you down. Just that was for y'all, because 
in case you missed it. I was daydreaming for a second, y'all. This is really surreal and really incredible that you guys have showed up for us and did the, the band and the, everything. It's, 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 it's taking me back. So, Impact, uh, when we were on, we doubled the enrollment in HBCUs during the time that we were on. And, and, and what that's led to is a whole bunch of, you know, people half a generation younger than me coming up to me telling me that they went to school because of me or because of us. And, and they loved the show so much that it inspired them to further their education. And nothing could be more important. Uh, and 35 years later, they make their kids watch it. And their kids want to go to Hillman. They, they think that that's a real school and they want to they wanna go and they want to find it. And they want to come to school with Jaleesa and, and yeah, Freddie and everybody. So the impact has been incredible for HBCUs and also for our lives as, as actors and, and pursuing what we love to do. But um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I really was lost in a daydream. I was sitting here looking at everybody going, wow. And then you said, I'll start with you. And I went, <laughs> it's okay. Oh, snap, I'm listening. So that's my answer for you. Cree, thank you. Uh, I too just want to say thank you because that was so beautiful. my beautiful freaks. Well, I just wanted to say that I grew up in Toronto by way of Saskatchewan, Canada. We didn't have any HBCUs in Canada. I had no idea what I was getting into. And it just broke my heart open to a, a part of black culture and black life that I would have never known anything about. So it changed me profoundly. And I got to witness and be a part of that change with everyone that approaches me. I get the sweetest little freaks that come up to me and say <laughs> that because of Winifred Freddie Brooks, they can let their freak flag fly <laughs> and be exactly who the fuck they are without being afraid of anything. And that's what I love about it. And, and I just think that was one of the best parts of A Different World was its inclusivity. And that finally on television, we were all multi-dimensional characters, not just one version of black life. Right. So, that's it. Thank you so much for that. You wanna go? Back at you when I'm ready. <laughs> okay, not Jasmine, it's your turn. I was just gonna say, one of the things that really blessed me is that it revealed to the world that an HBCU education is not a second class education. <laughs> It's an excellent education where, to Cree's point, Kadeem's point, there was a space and a lane for everyone. Um, the intellectual nerd, the, the free spirit that, you know, is looking for her direction, the person that hasn't given up on themselves, the person that came from privilege but yet still has so much growing and so much learning that they crave and want to do, the young man that has a perpetual hustle where nothing will keep him down. He will figure out a way to make it happen, come hella high water. We had, you know, Lou Myers as Mr. Gaines, our seasoned citizen, yes, who spoke into the lives of our students. We had Glenn Turman as our Colonel Taylor, who representing, yes, black excellence and commitment and service to our country. There was someone for everyone. Mary Alice, who was our resident director, our Letty, I mean, there was someone for everyone, and uh, it was just beautiful to see our community, our environment, that people who don't look like us are now like, whoa, but I wanna go to Hillman. I wanna go and be a part of this experience. That's what it did. That's what it did. It gave us our rightful light and our shine and our glow as people of color and the education that we are just amazing to have in this space, in these spaces, and, um, and then some. Mic check. Is it on? Thank you. 
Okay. I just wanted to say what a joy it was to be a part of a show that allowed us as artists to really go for it. A lot of times, um, for those of us that had done other shows before A Different World, we were um, the only black person on the set, so we had the weight of the whole race on our shoulder. And it's hard to be funny and um, consistent when you're always trying to be correct, because when you're playing a character, people aren't correct and characters aren't correct. It's, it's our flaws as characters that made us stronger. And you get to see us as young people work through what we didn't know and learn what we didn't know and accept each other for how we were different. And I think that was an important lesson in doing a show during that particular period from, you know, 17 years old to 20, well, I was already 25 when I got the part, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Them young peoples. <laughs> it's a crucial time in our development as human beings. You're away from home for the first time. You're in, in a strange language. You know, Whitley's character was very much set on what she already knew. It was. And I tried to. <laughs> I knew my job, you know. And the thing um, that I always loved about our ensemble is that we are very versatile. And um, Debbie didn't underestimate us. We did deep moments. We had, um, we danced, we sang. <laughs> yeah, we backed up Gladys Knight. Um, <laughs> But within that 30 minute period, we were real. We had a real journey and we still, of course, had to be funny because it was a sitcom. And I love that we were able to find humor in whatever episode they gave us, even the most. And we had some heavy ones that were a little difficult to do, like the Mommy Dearest and um, AIDS episode and the Riot episode. So the challenge for us as actors, I think, was tremendous there. And we really loved watching each other nail it, you know, watching Cree, well, Freddie, pray for the first time. <laughs> God, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never prayed before, but I think this would be a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love watching them work. I really did. <clears throat> So, let me say, with respect to HBCUs, there have been lots of other representations of HBCUs. They've been often imitated, but none have recreated the magic we have. That's true. That's true. Facts. A Different World remains the preeminent representation of HBCUs in film and television, full stop. One of the things that I enjoyed most, and if you want to talk about an HBCU experience, like, for first of all, I'm gonna need the band to come introduce me everywhere I go from now on. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Every time I sit down for an interview, I'll be like, wait up, hit it. <laughs> I need that. But one of the things that you saw that people tell you about an HBCU, and one of the things they talk about a college experience is that when you go off to college, you become an adult. That as opposed to high school and grammar school where your parents take you and make you show up to class in college, they don't care if you come. <laughs> At an HBCU, what we saw, I remember when Robert Guillaume played the dean, he took the time to get Ron to try to graduate. Dwayne took the time with the students. Colonel Taylor sat down with Blair Underwood, who was playing the soldier who was about to ship off, to talk to him about his experience. That is real about an HBCU. <laughs> and I think we all have that to thank, not only for Debbie Allen, who's a Howard alum, and by a second season saw to it, that we were going to make it look like an HBCU. And our head writer, Susan Thales, who was a Harvard grad, but also said, we're gonna make this college experience matter. And I, I, you know, for me, Kadeem Jasmine and I met on school days. I 
left college. That's right, college. God damn it. I left college to go audition for that film. When I left school, we were protesting apartheid. My brothers in Alpha, we were organizing voter registration drives. Then I went on camera to protest apartheid. It was life, Im art imitating life. That's what, you know, and when we got to Hillman, when it became about things that you actually experienced in college, that was the, the secret sauce in everything we did. Outstanding, thank you. I gotta talk about relationships because I was learning a lot about relationships when I used to watch A Different World. And there was one couple that I really could relate to. Dwayne and Whitley. So I just want to know, Dwayne, this is coming to you, to you at I'm some listening. point. Okay. I just want to know, what was it like having that relationship on camera? And then what type of impact do you think it had on how people viewed what their relationship should look like or not? <clears throat> Jasmine? <laughs> she said it was coming to me eventually. Okay, I'm well. I'm gonna let you ladies first. I thought you were gonna talk about how you didn't like how Dwayne was um, written by women for women. I always said that Dwayne Wayne was the perfect man created by woman for woman. And, and he, he put up with a lot of stuff that Kadeem would have never, <laughs> I would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. Uh, but, there, but was, there was some work, you know, we yeah. had to work on that relationship because uh, neither one of us, well, I, I'll speak for myself. I knew what my role was at first season and it didn't have nothing to do with goofy ass Dwayne Wayne. <laughs> I was like, what? I'm like, how does that work with her character? I was sorry, I mean, maybe she go out with an associate professor, you know? But um, we did talk about, okay, the things that I am playing are not necessarily um, attractive. They're funny, they're working, but I didn't feel like the accent was particularly attractive. I felt like her mannerisms were particularly annoying. I thought she was a classist at best. And I said, so we gotta help each other like these characters like each other. We already liked each other as people, but how are we gonna make it believable that this Southern debutante Likes you. <laughs> Underclassmen. Goofy. I mean, you had a little swag. Yeah, thank you. You always did, yeah. But we worked on it in a way where, I don't know, we kind of gave each other permission to show another side of our characters. So I just decided, well, when Whitley's around Dwayne, there's a part of her that she's only showing to him her vulnerability, she lets that guard down. Because, you know, after a while, he's like, you know, you're not just talking to me like that. She needed some boundaries, mm -hmm. you know? And watching them grow up together, I thought was really cute. Like, I used to think, oh, I wish I had a boyfriend from high school into my 30s, and we experienced, you know, growing up together. And I think, that part of it was really beautiful to watch them fight for each other and come back and in and out. Sound boy, you're in trouble. <laughs> Sound boy. Um, the greatest, the best part for me was I literally had Lucille Ball to work with. Like, really, the funniest, she danced, she sang, she acted, she wrote, she directed, she produced, she wrote books. I literally was in front of, and I didn't, I realized it very early, a living legend. 
So if she ever had a note for me, one time we had a scene. <laughs> I'm going to tell. Uh, we had a scene where she was coming in to my apartment, and I had to kind of, you know, flirt a little bit, and I wasn't hitting it. And she said, hold on, wait a minute. I'm going to be Dwayne, and you be Whitley, and watch what I do. <laughs> and the, and, and the, the heat, the shit lit up. <laughs> and I was like, so it's okay for me to go for it like that? And she said, yes, if we're going to play this, then you have to go for it. And then I went for it. <laughs> and, and then the relationship took off. And it was that one day in rehearsal where she unlocked it for me. And, and I could always listen to her. I could always trust her. Um, she always had the best notes. We'd have table reads. And, and I'd read it. And I'd pretty much go along with what was written until we got to stage. And then I'd try to fix it in my own way. But Jasmine would read it and then say, she wouldn't say that. This is what she'd say. She wouldn't just say no. She would have a solution kind of on hand, ready. And I was mostly in awe. You know what I mean? So it was easy to play like early crush and then eventual love. And then some of the stuff she was doing, like I said, I was perfect man created by a woman for a woman. Some of the stuff she did really pissed me off. <laughs> so it was easy to check her. It was easy to go into that, look here. Don't you ever, if you tell me you are not speaking to me for a week, I'll drop you like a bad habit, Whitney. And another thing, you knew I was a basketball fan before you met me, and you know it now. So please spare me them little dramas you perform every time I want to go to a game. Sound boy, sound boy, you're in trouble. You're in trouble, you're in trouble, uh -oh. sound boy. Kill the sound man, kill the sound man. No, 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 Somebody's no, no. changing the batteries, I think. Okay. Um, well, I want to talk about friendships um, because I got a chance to spend some time with you all backstage and see how you all interact as, you know, friends, really. But did the show, and this is for Cree and, and Dawn, did the show ever, uh, it, it highlighted the ups and downs of friendships the good, the bad. Uh, was there anything that you took away from the experience on set that uh, would resonate in your personal life? Or uh, do you have an experience on set that you want to share in regards to the friendships that you all had? Um, we had the most amazing group of people, all of us, Sometimes it's hard to get us all to focus at the same time. No, seriously, because we're enjoying each other so much. Everybody's got a, the, the amazing amount of wit and humor and fast one-liners and such, and it's impossible to not respond to each other. But what we found when it was time to work, you will not find a group of people that could be more focused, more prepared, more on point. So one of the things I learned in life is that it's okay to play hard if you're ready to work just as hard. You know what I mean? Come prepared for excellence. Enjoy what you do. Be a person that people enjoy being around. We really just enjoyed being around each other and creating that environment that was just safe, that was just okay to be you. But then when it was time to work, we got the work done. Debbie Allen had us down to a four day work week, which is unheard of in Hollywood. You take every single moment of every single day, every week, to try to get to the right formula, to get to the right seasoning for an episode. She was like, no, if everybody comes prepared and does what they were supposed to do, we can knock this out and have a three day weekend. And did we not do that season after season? Because this group of people, they know how to play, but when it's time to get down to it and eat, it's time to eat, let's go so we can all catch a flight because we're going to Vegas, all right? Creech? <laughs> uh, well, this show, as far as friendships and relationships, changed the molecules of my life. I mean, I fell in love with Jasmine at first sight. We just, just became sisters immediately. I fell in love with Kadeem. He was my first true love. And um, 
I just have to say that, you know, Daryl and Don, all of us, we hang out with each other on purpose. Jazzy and I, our firstborn daughters, share a birthday. And I've worked on a lot of shows and been privileged enough to work all over the world, but this is, these people are family and I will keep them uh, until I die. And that is one of the most profound gifts of a different world that not a lot of jobs do you leave work and call somebody as soon as you get into your truck. Usually just like chow mein, motherfuckers, but <laughs> these people you want to be with. <laughs> All right. See, what I know now, half of y'all are going to go home and go, chow mein, motherfucker. <laughs> you can't not respond to that. It's like, it is what it is. It's like, it's just pearls, just pearls, constant pearls. I come with a proper lack of decorum. <laughs> No one is just saying bye anymore. <laughs> it's like, Chow May. Chow May, Deuces. Hilarious. All right. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. Y'all behaving. OK. I saw somebody with, where's the sister with the t-shirt, relax, relate, release? Where you yeah. at? I saw you. Are you out here? Hey. OK, so that happened. Jasmine, uh, during a time when you were really feeling overwhelmed in one of the episodes. And um, you went to the counseling center and you got help and you, you know, started saying the phrase, relax, really, you can say it better than me. You want to go ahead and say it? Well, it came from, De it was Debbie's line. Okay. The doctors told me I needed to relax, relate, release. Okay. okay. Yes. Now, first of all, doing the scene, Debbie was directing the episode, so we didn't rehearse it that much. I was usually rehearsing it with a stand-in for her. And when we did the actual taping of that scene, and I saw how she was going to do it, I was like, oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to get my lines out. Her wig was crooked. <laughs> she was mocking me. And I was like, what do you want me to do, doctor? <laughs> You need to just relax, relate, relax. And I was like, oh God. And then I could feel that I was gonna lose it and I didn't want to have to do it over. And she was like, oh, come on, darling. Get, come on, let's get through this scene. I'm like, well, can you fix, fix your wig? I mean, <laughs> help me out, help me out. Because if I've known Debbie since I was 18, because I did fame. So there were times, and there were, there were a lot of times with Cree that I, I just couldn't look at her. I would look at her ear or her hairline. <laughs> because, but you know, when, like when you're in church and you start laughing inappropriately and you can't stop, it's painful. You're like... <laughs> And I was like, okay, I was just thinking about like really bad things and sad <laughs> things. And so a lot of times we, um, and I would, I would try to crack people up because Charnel Brown was immovable. Oh, she was I was like, I'm gonna bust up Charlie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Kimberly Reese in this scene. And no matter what I did, she would stay in character. She's so professional. So desperate. Whatever. <laughs> You know, I was like, okay, that didn't make her laugh. I'm gonna do it even bigger. And I'm looking, you know, <laughs> step and fetch it up there. And she's like, whatever, Jasmine, you are not breaking me. I am a professional. We had so many moments of true joy and laughter, you know, on and off camera. And everybody was funny on that show. I mean, we're working with, I mean, Glenn and Lou and Sinbad. There was sometimes we'd be in the pit and Luke couldn't remember our character <laughs> names. <laughs> He'd be like, J -j 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 you Kim Kimberly Ball, Freddy or Winifred, and we'd be like, oh God, if you don't say somebody's name soon. <laughs> it was just a joy. It really was. A, a follow up to that, though, is that you were actually dealing with a mental health issue long before 
you know, we deal with shows that deal with mental health issues now. And so, I mean, that was really groundbreaking for you all to take on that topic. And even though there were lighthearted parts of it, it still was the issue of mental health, getting counseling. Um, seeking therapy, seeking therapy. And not being ashamed or not Absolutely. Being, especially in the black community that, you know, has been taboo for us to get help because we're supposed to bear everything. We're supposed to bear everything. Pain, trauma, loss, divorce, where we're watching everybody else going through these things and they need help, they need support get to get through it. So that, that is something I didn't really think about that it was um, odd for a young woman in college to go get uh, therapy like that. And just that um, acceptance of it, you know, or making it funny makes it a little bit more accessible, but it was a serious uh, issue. And she was, she did need to relax, relax, relax. <laughs> she really did. She was, she was just wild like this, you know? And she's like, you know, let this man love you. Like, what is the problem? What are you complaining about? Sometimes we make up problems. Mm. Facts. Okay. I'm taking a turn now because I, I want to talk about some of the other issues, the serious issues. And uh, Kadeem, you dealt with this, Daryl, as well. When you said the line, I'm an educated black man, your worst nightmare. And you all dealt with some racism that was going on. So, Daryl, I want you to talk. And then, Kadeem, what was that episode like? Uh, when you dealt with that and you really had to deal with, you know, probably something you had dealt with in your personal life before as well. Kadeem and I talk about this all the time when people ask you what's your favorite episode, Cats in the Cradle, that's it. And what I remember most about that week was were the two actors who were the white actors. Uh, Dean Cain, it was his first job ever in television before he played Superman. The other actor was really good. I mean, he was, he was the one when they talked about N.I. was written on the car, he said, how do you know he wasn't writing Have a Nice Day? Yeah. I mean, he was cold-blooded with his. And it was hard because Dean was a friend, too. And so to, to play that kind of animus with him was really tricky. And so... What I really liked, and, and Kadima talked about this earlier, was that you, the story was told Rashomon style. So you saw everyone's point of view, the retelling of it through their eyes, showing how people experienced the same events differently. How they thought we were thugs, liars. How we thought that you know they were just so over the top antagonizing us. And irrespective of how the principles involved solve their differences, somebody else finished it. Somebody else finished writing it on the car. And it just shows no matter how you work, there's more work to be done. And that's why it, it remains, our, you know, our favorite episode of what we had to play, the way, you know, the comment about there's a black girl I would do. You know, who would say that? It, it was racist, sexist, it was everything that you, you as unconscionable as you could want. And, you know, this was a half hour sitcom. But it's, it's why when, when we talk about issues that remain relevant today, look at all that we still face in our community. Look at all we still face to protect the women we love. I have been arrested driving while black multiple times. It happens. So, uh, it, it's, a, it's a similar moment. I, I will also say, only because you asked about our friendship, we were in, in school days, just random. If y'all go back and watch school days, in the parade episode, Kadeem and I are lined up right against each other. And I can't look at Kadeem really without laughing. Because it, this was his first acting job, folks. True. <laughs> true. And if you, you know, every time we'd have to get in each other's face, because one of the hardest things to play was the fight that Ron and Dwayne had. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time, like Kadeem didn't talk to me the whole week, but in school days, I have on mirrored glasses. 
and Kadeem would get right in my face. And I would look this way. And when I would turn that way, I would close my eyes so I couldn't see him through the mirror glasses. Because if I looked at him, I'd crack up because that's, that's my man that I love. And I can't be mad at him. And it's really hard. So th that speaks to how our friendship interfered with our work until I could grow up as a performer to, to actually do the work. <laughs> it's real tough. For me, Cats in the Cradle is so great because, you know, for so long I wanted to, you know, I wanted to do action movies, I wanted to do, you know, uh, love stories, I wanted to do everything, and this had all of that in one episode. Yeah. I got to be a little bit of thug, I got to be the smart guy, I got to be, I got to do a fight scene, all of it, that care for the woman, all of that at once. So it was, come on baby, talk to me. I hear you. That's okay. It's, we love baby sounds. It's the best sound. She gonna go to college one day, he and she. She in the right place. Um, so yeah, so that, that episode, just as an actor and, and watching him grow, because I was standing there with him in his first job and he couldn't even look me in the eye. Poor thing. <laughs> I was mopping the floor with him. So now I was, I watched him grow into a point where we were standing up there together, side by side, giving looks, giving attitude, playing all of that stuff. And it just, the most fulfilling episode. And I'm gonna talk really fast. Kadeem and I both auditioned for the role of Dwayne Wayne. Yes. When, when, we, when we left school days, we both, we were, we were already friends. And when the role for Dwayne Wayne came up, I got an audition. I called Kadeem. Did you say, I said, did you hear about it? He said, yes, I did. He said, I got a call back. He said, me too. He said, I'm going in for producers. He said, me too. He said, they're taking me to network. He said, they're flying me to LA. I'm like, okay. So when we got to LA, I remember Kadeem was the first one to go in and all I heard was laughter. He came out, they was giving him high fives and yeah, buddy, yeah. And giving him all this business, right? And, I walked in and I had never auditioned for more than two people at a time. When I walked in, there was a crowd like this. I froze, it was the worst audition I ever got. Kadeem gets cast in a role. Kadeem lives in New York. He has to relocate to Los Angeles. He has nowhere to stay. He moves in with me. On his couch. So I had to drive Kadeem to work to the job I didn't get every day. And he had to pick me up afterwards oh! and take me home. Those are facts. <laughs> that is love. I just want to ask the bosses. I know we're supposed to take some questions. Is it time yet to, no, yes? Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so we have microphones uh, and individuals that have the microphones. So you don't even have to move. So just raise your hand if you want to ask a question and our lovely. While they're trying to get the microphone, I just want to thank Chancellor for receiving us yes. here at Elizabeth State University. Yes. I, I want to thank back. all our partners at Truist Bank yes, for making Truist. this happen for us. Mark Johnson. <laughs> and thank all y'all for coming out on the Thursday night. Thank you. There's some hands back in the back, in the middle. They got their light on, too. Oh, they got the light. They want you to, okay, they there go. The go. House they lights. go it. <laughs> now we got it. <laughs> uh, first off, I would like to say, Jasmine, you was my favorite character in Vampire Diaries. You was my favorite character in a, new, a different word, I mean world, and use my different character in Harlem Nights. So yes. with that being said, I feel as though you did an amazing job and I love you. Um, but my question is, what are the steps that you have to take in order to like pursue that dream? To pursue? Pursue your dream. Your dream. Which oh. is acting. Ooh, oh, in acting. Mm -hmm. oh. I, everybody's gonna have a different answer. Yeah, because everybody's journey is a little different and part of the experience of any performer, it is essentially the only job for which there is no absolute requirement. You can say you are a professional actor today, and you are. The only distinction is your ability to compete against your peers to get a job. Hmm. So you don't have to go to school 
to get a job as a dancer, so you have to be competent and proficient. Now, there are programs that will help train you in training matters. And to be a master craftsman at anything requires a skill set. That being said, the number one differentiator from when we started to when anyone else wants to pursue a career in performing arts now is the barrier to entrance was distribution. If you, you couldn't get on a network or a movie studio, you couldn't be seen. Now distribution is free. YouTube, social media, Instagram, Vimeo. If you are not creating your own content, you are falling behind. What we saw today with, with, the, with the recreation of the different world credits, that's, what, that's where you have to be. Casting now is done day and night based on how many followers you got. That happens. So there's so many folks that I know y'all follow who create content online, that matters. And I will tell you, two of the, the most prolific directors, writer, producers, the Duplass brothers, they talked about how they started their career. And the brothers said, one brother wrote the script, the other brother got the camera, and they went out and shot their first movie. And this is an adult crowd, so I can tell you what they said was, it was a hot, steaming pile of shit. They went the next day and they did it again. They went the next day and they did it again and they kept getting better. The difference between those who are the most successful and those who are not is putting in the work. Stephen King talks about there are so many writers that are infinitely more talented than him, but he goes to work from nine to five and writes every day. You are what you do every day. That's what's up. Um, hello everyone, my name is Kaylin Jones. I'm a sophomore criminal justice major. Um, the question that I have is, what are some advice that you have for college students? I feel like you briefly touched on this, but yeah. Advice for college students? The, the, I did, we didn't hear the last part of your Oh, question. yes, I said, I'm sorry. Uh, I feel like you briefly touched on this, but I would, would like to know some advice that you have for college students. Advice you have for college students? Y'all want, anybody want? I didn't go to college. Okay. Right, right. right. <laughs> All right. Dawn, would you? I, I can Hillman. jump in, but I, I'd love for it to, you know, another voice. Uh, advice for college students is this, is this is a big, huge platter of opportunity and information. Uh, take advantage of it. Uh, how many of you are here on scholarships? How many of you are here on student loans? How many of you are here at college work study? Okay. So the, the reality is, is that college is very expensive. It is incredibly expensive. So if you've, if you've already made the financial investment into being here, then your responsibility is to milk this environment for everything that it is worth. <laughs> milk it for everything that it is worth. Learn a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it gives you an opportunity to be exposed to a, a, I'm gonna use a veritable cornucopia of information oh, okay. and opportunity for you to decide, this is where I want to move forward. You know what I mean? And you're in a safe environment in order to explore and express that. Because when you get out of here, things get real, real. Bills are real. You know, eating is real. Putting gas in your car is real. If you live in LA, gas is almost $7 a gallon. Gas is over $6.60 $6 a gallon. So that's real. There's no more cover. There's no more safe landings. You are now responsible for you. So here is where you start to practice that. So as a college student and you're here, get in the habit of being responsible for you, take advantage and maximize everything that, that is presented to you so you can make an informed decision of where you want to be next and how you want to get there. I'm going to add two seconds to that. There was a venture capitalist talking to a bunch of Stanford students. He said, none of you will have a problem finding a job because you're all going to create the job that you want. That's facts. That's, that's an expectation that they have because the Stanford engineering students get together with the Stanford law students who get together with the Stanford business students and they create companies that change the world. When you are at college, I can tell you Robert Smith, the wealthiest black man in America, we went to college together. He was at Cornell, I was at Syracuse. You will meet people right now in this room who are your classmates who will be the presidents and the, and the 
influencers, and you will be able to pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, Viking Pride, pick up the phone. That will matter. Oh, there it is. All right. Hello. I don't have a question. I don't. I love y'all so much. Like, I really don't think you understand. Down from season one to season six, when, like, Jada Pickett was there in season six. Okay, I really, 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 like, I know it down to the theme songs with season we on. Real bad. But, um, I'm not singing. All right. All right. Now, so the show was still going in my head, okay? When y'all stopped in um, season six, when you went to Kanishiwa and Korea and all that, and you was pregnant, what baby did y'all have? Did y'all have a boy or a girl? You were requested to sing the song. I really don't know all the words. It's a different world. Oh yeah, from where I come from. Mm, yes, it is now. And mm, nom, 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 nom. Yeah. I really don't know all the words. You gotta hit this shit. You gotta hit this shit. Which one? If oh, you if, if you we, this shit, thank we you. Can just Thank remember you. what you've you been, been told. told. Damn, damn. It's, it's a different world. It's a different world. It's a different world. It's a different and way to come from. Ooh, 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 ooh. And where you come from. Okay. Yes. Okay, now I'm impressed. You can't, you you can't quit the song it. before you hit this shit. <laughs> you hit well, it, though. You sound good, too. That, she back, you, she back you, there. Is she leaving? No, she going around. Oh, she making an exit back there. Oh, baby, I see. <laughs> you need to be in the Glee Club. You got some lungs. She can sing. <laughs> I don't know what the question was, but I enjoyed it. Did you have a boy or girl? I don't know if Whitley had a boy or girl. I know what I think she would have had, but I really don't know what other people think. Oh. I think she had a, a boy, a son. Okay. We're going to go with that. Was he naked? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to. I couldn't help myself. No, he came out in a tux. Okay. A little baby tux. Uh. Hey, you guys. So I'm Infinity. I am a senior interdisciplinary studies student, and I'm also Miss Senior for the university. Hey, y'all. And so my question is, how does it feel being able to see a different world now while people are using it as a reference? Like, I know I'm a TikToker. I see Whitley and Dwayne and the friendships and things like that as references. People go back and look at that. So how do you guys feel being that reference? Good question, ain't it? I think we feel honored, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, we're honored that uh, the show is still alive 35 years later. So um, thank, thanks to you. And I, and I, I think Daryl had a, a, a stat that Different World hasn't stopped airing since. Different World has not been off the air since it premiered in 1987. Wow. It has been available wow. every day since 1987. You. You're welcome. At Cree, did you want to say something? Because you got the mic. Oh, I was just going to say exactly what Kadeem said. It's just such an incredible honor. You know, sometimes I walk down the street and somebody says, look at my hair, that's because of Freddie, or something, you know, or, or what they do, you know, or I'm, I'm Ron Johnson, or I'm Kadeem, and, you know, it's just a legacy. And yeah. it's something that we have a lot of different jobs as actors, and this is one that we will eternally be proud of. Because, you know, above all in life, you wish to do no harm. 
And this show has simply injected love into the black community. Yes, it has. It has. We are at the conclusion. I just want to give each of you like one minute, two minutes uh, as a wrapping statement, just to, something to leave us with. Whoever I, would like to start first. You're I love welcome. you all. Good night. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for, all for coming. This was awesome. Thank you. I love y'all. This, this has been fantastic. I had to take two planes to get here. Um, I'm not really crazy about flying, but this was well worth it. Oh, okay. Dang, 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 da, dang, dang. <laughs> I would just like to say thank you, beautiful people, so much, and chow mein, motherfuckers. <laughs> oh, I love her so much. Um, th thank you again. You guys are amazing. You guys have made what we did decades ago invaluable and precious, and you are a walking testimony that when you see it, you can be it. And um, it just blesses my heart that half of you weren't even born when we were on, when the show first aired, but some of you are here and you've brought your children and your children's children that they are here in this room getting this experience of, you know, it's entertainment, but it's education. And um, I want to give a shout out to my family who lives here in the Virginia area. My 15-year-old my nephew is almost seven feet tall, but he's in a room now inspired by you all going to college. And no pressure, but Jay, this is where you need to be. This is where you need to be. Um, so, all of you, God bless you. Keep up the hard work. Keep up the good work. This is the, you know, what do they call it? Good trouble. We making good trouble here in Elizabeth City. I want to um, echo the gratitude. What? Thank you. And thank you for calling me my real name. I appreciate it. My mama appreciates it. Okay. Um, we just feel your, your love and your spirit, your enthusiasm. Um, sometimes, I'll speak for myself, I don't know if, we're, if we still resonate. You know, I don't know if something that I did, you know, 30 years ago still resonates. And I'm so glad you shared that with us. It means a lot to me. And I am very grateful to have been a part of this show. And thank you for making me grateful for that experience. So to bring it all home, I want to tell you, we do lots of panels. We don't always get this kind of energy and love. So thank all y'all. This is really special. Those are facts. I'm also going to take a minute to thank April Woodard for coming out here and moderating. But I want y'all to know that for all of these people who I love to get here and for all the things we've done, I'm going to get up for your own Dr. Kevin Wade. Where are you at? Where are you at, Dr. Kevin Wade? Dr. Kevin Wade made this happen. This would not have gone down without the persistence, insistence, and tenacity of Dr. Kevin Don't y'all love when a plan come together? Viking yeah. Pride! Viking Pride! Viking Pride! I'm gonna make this real quick. I have a lot of thank yous. I wanna thank Constance um, Davenport. If you were out there, thank you so much for your vocals behind the scene um, of us doing, recreating the video. Thank you, Truist Bank. We'll circle back to that. Um, Truist representatives, um, can you make your way to the stage for me, please, if you're out there, up this way. Um, my career development and 
TRIO team, thank you so much for your support. Thank you, um, Student Affairs. Thank you, Sound of Class. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And i also like to thank um, Chancellor Dixon and her cabinet and my supervisor, Dr. Brown, for trusting me with this vision. I appreciate it so very much. Thank you, 1704 Media, Communications and Marketing. Everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you. So at this time, I'd like to bring up Chancellor Dixon as well as Dr. Brown. So we have a very special presentation. Make sure y'all were still up. Hey, my name is Mark Johnson, Senior Vice President of Truist Bank for the Commonwealth of Virginia. It is a pleasure being in the state of Virginia and the city of Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Um, quickly, I have to say how I got here. I have a colleague counterpart in North Carolina. That's this how it works. I'm responsible for Virginia. He's responsible for North Carolina. He could not be here because of his work schedule. He was overloaded this week. So give a hand to Mitch Gibson, Senior Vice President of Community Development Manager for North Carolina, for creating this opportunity for us. We did it together at Truist. We inspire and build better lives in communities. And the other saying for us is, when it starts with care, you get a different kind of bang. So we thank you so much for this opportunity to partner. Let me say, you guys are incredible. Give a hand. What a journey. Thank you so much to Chancellor Dr. Carrie Dixon, her staff, amazing team. And, last, and lastly, now listen, I had my collar on today. I had to do a presentation at the luncheon. Some people thought I was a pastor. I don't know how. Yeah. I don't prophesy, but I have to say, Dr. Kevin Wade, your gift shall make room for you and bring you before a great man. What an incredible production that you put on that came from the heart but it also showed the talent that you have. You are just an incredible talent. And I'm telling you, Dr. <laughs> Chancellor Dixon, you should be blessed to have him on staff. He didn't pay me to say that, but after I seen this tonight, and the cast will probably attest, we did this some odd years ago in uh, Norfolk State. Elizabeth said, you put it down. So on behalf of Truist Bank, we'd like to present the Elizabeth City State Foundation uh, with a check for Money Matters for $25,000. Okay? Yes. And I would, be, I would be remiss, we have a one-team approach. I know I'm up here speaking, but listen, we have people behind the scenes that do the work every day and they make it happen and they speak to clients and they improve lives. Let me give before you Cecilia Huff, Jeremy Bailey, Frederick Stol Stoltworth, and let me see. I think that's it. Let's all get in the picture. And a foundation chair. Oh, how are you? Thank you. I'll get in the Oh, I, I'll hold on to it. I can hold it? Okay, let's hold on. Quickly, 
on be also on behalf of Truist, I partnered with this gentleman. I don't know if you've heard of this game, the HBCU trivia game. So, who's the the gentleman who owns this? That, can you stand up, Mr. Khan? Yes, outstanding. And so, as a part of this, I have five of these that I will give to Chancellor Dixon to give out to whom she wants to support support African American business in the city of Elizabeth City and wherever you go. This is a black-owned business. Who have produced this? Let's get back to basics. I know you use technology. This is back manually. This is back in my time. Let's get back to the board games. Thank you. I got five more for you. I think you already got Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Students, special uh, message. If you are a student and going to Midnight Calf, we need you to line up on this side to get your wristband. If not, thank you all so much and have a good night.